Since the beginning of time, man has been doodling. Only recently, however, has the activity become something of a national pastime. And only recently have scholars in a number of fields begun to interpret this phenomenon. For the most part, it has been found to be a harmless enough diversion. In certain rare instances, however, it can be dangerous. This is the story of a man whom we shall call David Watt. David Watt's earliest drawings seem to indicate that he was a happy, well-balanced child. Here we see a representation of his house and family, and a rare self-portrait of himself in the middle. Everything seems in order. There are flowers in the yard, the sun in the sky, and there is no indication of any disturbances to come. Here we see David Watt in school where he encounters for the first time that discipline which is to make of him a good and mature citizen. David Watt is learning to print the letters of the alphabet. His natural aptitude in this field earned him frequent and varied recognition. We have carefully searched the available documents for some early sign of the weakness which was later to prove David Watt's undoing. The only evidence we are able to find is this grade two exercise book cover, where, in the act of printing his own name, he apparently suffered a temporary lapse of attention. This may be David Watt's first doodle. It is not until some time later, however, that we see the first real evidence of chronic doodling. Here, for instance, is a grade seven exercise book cover, seen in its successive stages from the beginning to the end of the school year. But none of this is abnormal in a spirited young boy. The subject matter of his doodles shows evidence of healthy preoccupations for his age. He played games as well, current at the time, squares, tic-tac-toe, and the educational word game of hang the man, at which, or so we have been told, he was particularly adept. Puberty for David Watt was as difficult a time as it is for most boys. His doodles of the period reflect his obsessions, his fears, his secret desires, as well as a not uncommon ignorance of female anatomy. At times he had to quickly camouflage his work in order to avoid discovery. The extent of his preoccupation was such that he would devise a lewd interpretation even of an ordinary geometric diagram. Not without, it must be admitted, a certain wit. These preoccupations were all abandoned, however, when David Watt met what seems to have been his one true love. Mara is her name. We have no likenesses of her surviving, only countless examples of her name reverently scrawled on shirt cardboards, paper napkins, among other places. Here he is inscribing a book of poetry for her. What entered her name in his personal address book at the beginning of the relationship and deleted it some time later? Mara's disappearance from his life, still unexplained, was as definitive as it was abrupt. Time passed. David Watt married, became a father, and went out to face the world. His early career had both its ups and its downs but he soon began to show great promise and to win the grudging respect of his superiors. His tax returns were always exemplary 
and he gave of himself not only from the pocketbook, but out of his very bloodstream. A patriotic man, an active participant in the democratic process, he did his best to provide for his family, no matter what the eventuality. Long years of effort gladly reaped their reward, and David Watt's name at the bottom of a sheet of paper came to carry more and more weight. All this time he was experimenting with his signature, for it occurred to him one day that important people always seem to have signatures that look as though they are the signatures of important people. And so David Watt embarked upon a program to develop for himself an important signature. He seems to have reached his peak with this rather baroque variation. And it is from here that we may trace a curious deterioration in the signature, as though the subject were undergoing some subtle, though perhaps not insignificant, crisis. The onset was gradual, almost innocuous. A few little squibbles on bits of scrap paper, nothing apparently to be concerned about. Some indeed have been impressed by the aesthetic qualities of Watt's doodling at this juncture. Already, however, certain examples, while superficially attractive, seem to pose some unanswered questions. In any case, soon discordant elements begin to appear. A certain moodiness begins to manifest itself. Note, for instance, the eyes in the following series of drawings. This moodiness imperceptibly gives way to a more or less unambiguous hostility and an increasing absence of logical progression from one stage of the drawing to the next. The gravity of the situation soon became clear to all concerned. We may cite the following examples. Item. A contract of some importance, never signed. Item. One business letter, never to be sent. An urgent memo, left unopened. Watts' income tax return for the past year. And his desk blotter, before and after his tendencies came fully to light. For the following photographic records, we are grateful to the former Mrs. Watt. Watt's table setting. Watt's car windshield. Interior view and exterior view. His television screen. Sunday evening, prime time. His bathroom mirror. Bathtub, etc. The Watt bedsheets after another widow's night for Mrs. Watt, and Mrs. Watt after another of those nights. For some months, David Watt received treatment from Dr. Engstrand of the Moslovsky Institute, and for a time there seemed to be some improvement, as is indicated by these symbolic sheets of unmarked paper. We are satisfied that Watt was given every opportunity to reassume his role in society. Alas, this final item in our dossier constitutes his only response. Since Watt's disappearance, this curious emblem has been remarked with increasing frequency in various public places. It has been given various interpretations. Various measures have been taken to attempt to check its spread. Finally, it is suspected that David Watt alone could not have been responsible for all the appearances reported to date. We are now therefore inclined to regard Watt's case as symptomatic of a growing problem of serious social and economic implications it is this larger aspect which we hope to deal with in more detailed fashion in a subsequent report.